Hey YouTube, how's it going? I'm back again with another book review, and this time I'll be reviewing Thomas Mann's The Magic Mountain. Um, now this book took me a while to read, and it's not only because it's quite long, my edition is 850 pages, but because I found it to be very difficult to, uh, to read at a kind of leisurely, fast, I found it difficult to read in a very breezy way. It really is one of those novels that requires a lot of your attention. It is one of your novels that, it's one of those novels that you hope will be rewarding by the time you finish reading it, but that you kind of do struggle uh, along the way. In my case, I thought of abandoning the book more than once while reading it in the four or five months it took me to finish it. And it's the only book I've read so far in 2021, um, hence the lack of reviews. So I'm hoping this will make up for it. What is The Magic Mountain about? Um, main plot of the book is the, this young German engineer, Hans Kastorp, visiting his cousin that is seeking treatment for a lung ailment, maybe a form of tuberculosis, and a sanatorium in uh, Davos, Switzerland. A uh, sanatorium, for those of you who don't know, are kind of like those hospitals that were fa kind of fashionable in Europe at the time, and maybe they are now, where doctors would prescribe their patients to take breaks in you know, countries where the air or the um, climate was very favorable towards uh, you know, improving your health. Um, I don't really know if sanatoriums, like, I don't even know if that's medical practice now, but at a time that it was, and this is where the whole novel takes place. Um, Hans, Hans uh, visits his cousin, and is initially, he's initially supposed to stay there for only three weeks, but ends up staying there for seven years after a checkup from uh, the director of the sanatorium reveals that he has a uh, some kind of dark spot in his lungs and that he's encouraged to stay for longer uh, indefinitely until his situation improves so that he go back to his normal life. Um, this is a very well written, a uh, very intellectual and kind of symbolic novel. There's a lot of hidden meanings beneath the surface. If you read it as a, if you try to read like a normal novel, you feel like nothing's going on, it's very boring. There's not much to engage the reader in terms of plot, you know, plot, drama, or anything. It is very much a novel of ideas, and it kind of, it, it kind of is, it, I don't know at the time if it was man's attention to do this, but it really alienates a huge subsection of readers, especially today. Nobody wants to take up an 800, 900 page book, whether or not it is entertaining, let alone if it is, you know, very, you know, demanding. Um, and I didn't find this to be a very difficult book, but I found it to be boring. And that is one of the reasons why I want to stop reading it. And I take John Williams' advice that it's absurd to read a book unless, like, like, like you're not enjoying it. Like, even challenging books are enjoyable to read. But this one just felt like one big, long drip of intellectual... Uh, bullshittery <laughs> written from a bourgeoisie German guy that just wanted to give his thoughts about um, life and Europe uh, before the outbreak of World War One. But I do think the novel, I do think it is unfair to to say that of the novel without talking about it, it, some of its um, merits. I think this is really a novel more than just about uh, intellectual ideas discussed by different characters in the book. Hans Kostorp is a young man that arrives at the sanatorium at a time in his life when you know he's, he doesn't have a lot of roots, he doesn't have a very firm idea of who he is, he's just beginning his career as a, as a student maybe, an engineering student or an engineering apprentice, and uh, is very susceptible to the influences of the outside world. And when he has this prolonged stay in the sanatorium, now he's going to be influenced by all these um, people in, this, in, 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 in that that 
are chronically ill. Um, and we see over the course of the novel of him developing morally, intellectually, and emotionally, maybe sexually. Um, and the novel is rewarding if you take your time with it and see the development of Hans's arc and try to just enjoy it at your own pace without like wanting to finish it for the sake of saying I finished it. I think that's how you should go out reading everything. Um, I mean, that's about it for the plot. It, it, it is very much that, and I don't want to spoil too much than what I already have. Um, in the sanatorium, Hans Castor meets you know a lot of interesting characters, uh, about few like maybe four or five of whom are like major characters that play a role at his stay while he's in sanatorium. Um, his cousin Joaquim Zimson um, is this uh, soldier who's very keen on going back to the flatlands, which is like the world, uh, the world, uh, normal world. Uh, that uh, flatlands is like the normal world where everybody's probably been ripped apart from after being sent to the, the Magic Mountain, the sanitarium, and. He's kind of like embodiment of duty. Uh, he always wants to do what is right. He always wants to get well as soon as possible so he can go back to his uh, you know military training. Um, there are other characters in the book that maybe like four or five of the main ones that they represent a certain ideal or principle. And I just looked at this. I looked this up in the Wikipedia page. I'm not a genius for thinking this through. Uh, one of the most notable characters in the book is this Italian uh, scholar, writer called Ludovico Stambrini. He acts as a kind of what do you call it, a pedagogue or like mentor to, for, for Hans Castorp trying to uh, espouse these, you know, humane, you know, humanistic enlightenment values on him uh, and trying to ward off against uh, ward off young Hans against fascination with death, morbidity, and and, and uh, you know being tempted by uh, you know uh, lust and women. Um, he seems to be kind of like yeah, your standard liberal Democrat, apparently idealist, like the the the. the, the the character's model after Thomas Mann's brother, Heinrich Mann, who was like a staunch, like I think, social democrat or liberal democrat who believed in these values. Um, another character that is kind of acts as a kind of antagonist to Senebrini is Leo Nafta. He is like a Jew that ends up becoming a Jesuit, uh, but he has pretty... I don't want to call it like extreme radical like ideas about how society should function. His views are kind of characterized as being in opposition to Senebrini. He calls Senebrini's like ideals for tolerance, progress, and enlightenment bourgeoisie values, which I completely understand because as you know, as good as like these values sound like, you know, um, human rights and progress and everything, they're kind of built on exploitation and you know um, power relations that leaves uh, people at the, the working class and 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 those at the bottom of society still like the lurch. But I, NAFTA's ideas become more radical as the novel goes on. He kind of it's kind of hinted he kind of loses it, um, and he seems to act as a kind of embodiment of also like the rise in fascism and fanaticism. Uh, that was going around around Europe at the time, and this is around World War One, even not World War Two. Um, third character is Claudia Kosha. I'm not really sure if it's Claudia or Claudia because there's a V in my edition, but I've never heard of you know the naming Claudia. Uh, but I'm gonna call, I'm gonna call her by that, uh, and it's, I think it's Shosha, not not Kosha, um, and she is kind of the. Hans, Hans's, Hans Castorp's love interest. I really don't feel like she figures much in a novel. I think she's just one of those characters that are there to be the love interest. It's kind of like the trope of like, oh, it's a book written by a man, so all female characters are just, you know, um, ex, you know, expressions of like man's lust. I mean, 
It's a book written early 20th century by a man, and from, from what I re read, uh, Thomas Mann is actually gay, but still, it's kind of disappointing that even for a great writer, a lot of the women in the books don't really have uh, full-fledged personalities as much as, like, the men. But she is still an interesting character in her own right. I, I think I found her more interesting than those two uh, intellectuals that are kind of like windbags and I pretty pre pretty much more interested in the effect she has on Hans Castorp's development. Um, she basically acts as like his love interest and she, there's only they don't talk for like a year. <laughs> Shit, I don't know if I'm supposed to spoil it or not. But anyway, he approaches her on the Walpurgis night, uh, you know, where like it's some kind of like weird German thing where like witches and wizards get together. I think it's like uh, something that is you know alludes to a chapter in Faust, which has the same title. And he speaks to her for the first time after a year of being there and like ignoring her and watching from a distance. He speaks to her and talks to her a whole conversation in French, which is one of my favorite chapters in the novel and uh, finally talks about his uh, feelings towards her, which he then promptly, re you know, rebuffs, understandably so, because, hey, I've been here for a year, and by the way, I'm going to be gone tomorrow because I'm going to go back to see my husband. Um, and and, and uh, even though she, and, and she hints that she'll be back sometime, and this hint of her coming back sometime, but indefinitely, is one of the main motivations for why uh, Hans decides to stay in a sanatorium for you know longer. Um, he he could leave whenever he wants, and maybe even after years, when maybe his condition moves, but he stays hoping for the one day she comes back. Um, I think the last major character would be this Dutch coffee merchant called Peter or Peter, Peter Piepercorn, who is like this fairly old man. You know, was probably sixty years old. Remember. For a novel, who when he arrives comes back with Claudia Shosha and is his lover, her her lover, and he arrives pretty late in the novel, and he kind of has also a very strong influence on Hans Castorp's uh, development, this young you know young man, but not as a pedagogue, not as an intellectual. He seems to embody uh, the Dionysian spirit, and. I actually like this character. He's a lot more interesting than most in the book, um, and he only and because he comes like late in the novel, you don't really feel like he's been he's a big part of the novel. But his effect on not just Castor but everybody else in the sanatorium is huge. He, I mean, I want to explain a bit what the Nijan principle is by reading a bit from Nietzsche's uh, *The Birth of a Tragedy* which is where um, Thomas Mann got the title for The Magic Mountain. And the Dionysian principle is, from what I understand, this idea of like, like the emotional or um, self-indulgent aspect of man, uh, and opposed to Apollinian, Apo, 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 Apollinian principle, which is like more about order, structure, and reason. I might be butchering this, but here I go. Either under the influence of the nar narcotic draught, of which the songs of all primitive men and people speak, or with a potent calming of spirit of spring that penetrates all nature with joy, these Dionysian emotions awake, and as they grow in intensity, everything subjective vanishes into cleep self-forgetfulness. The German Middle Ages, too, singing and dancing crowds, ever increasing in number, whirl themselves from place to place under the same Dionysian impulse. And these dancers of St. John and St. Vitus, we did discover the Bacchic courses of the Greeks, with their prehistory in Asia Minor, as far as back as Babylon and the Orgiastic Sashia. There are, there, are some of, there are some who, from, a t from obtuseness or lack of experience, turn away from such phenomena as from folk diseases, which con with contempt or pity born of the consciousness of their own healthy-mindedness. But of course, such poor wretches, no idea how corpse-like and ghostly their so-called healthy mindedness looks when a glowing life of the Dionysian revelers roars past them. I don't know if 
this is enough to explain the idea of the Dionysian principle, but it's basically this 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 kind of feeling or this temptation to want to let go and not just party, but uh, lose yourself in art and dance in this primitive inner thing that we have. And wait, and I think this is better expressed in the second page. In song and in dance, man expresses himself as a member of a higher community. He has forgotten how to walk and speak, and is on the way towards flying into the air, dancing. His very gestures expre express enchantment. Just as animals now talk, and the earth yields milk and honey, supernatural sounds emanate from him, too. He feels himself a god. He himself now walks about enchanted in ecstasy, like the gods he saw walking in his dreams. He's no longer an artist. He has become a work of art. This is nice. I, I think that's that's just a very like Nietzsche does it. Like it's kind of funny because like Pi Peter Piper Corn also has this uh, characterized of not being able to finish a sentence and in that passage, um, the second part of that passage, it's like it's man forgets how to talk and 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 it's obvious that man man was influenced by uh, Nietzsche's uh, view on aesthetics and the birth of a, birth of a tragedy and Piper Corn. Now I'm going to spoil what happens, actually. Forget about it. Piper Corn spends a very short amount of time in the book, but his influence is felt because even though he's not he's aggressively inarticulate, even though he doesn't have anything to, to teach constantly intellectually, he commands a very strong presence. He makes a party, makes a party, he buys everyone, you know, wine, food, the best. He gives money for the waiters and chefs to, to, to arrange a secret forbidden party. And uh, at the end... Close to the end of uh, the, the party, he, he forces Hans, Castor, and Claudia Kosha, his his lover, to, to kiss. Even it, it, which is, which is, it's a very tender scene. Um, and yeah, I, I would say it's my favorite character. Um, but that's about it for characters. I want to keep this short and end this with a short commentary of what I think the Magic Mountain might be about. And this book, I don't think it's about one thing. It's a highly symbolic book. Under different readings and multiple readings, you'll have different interpretations. But just one of those books, I think that as you get older, as you do more research, as you read more, uh, you know, texts that that are uh, that the book alludes to, you probably have a better understanding. Um, I really think towards the end of the book that Ma Thomas Mann was writing about his concerns about the First World War and the rise of fascism and, and, and uh, the danger of this erosion of basic enlightenment values. And it was weird. At first, Cenabrini was kind of also portrayed as a bit of a caricature of an enlightenment figure. He was intelligent, highly articulate, but he was considered as an organ grinder, a windbag, who wouldn't shut up and trying to lecture people about, you know, what is right and what is wrong and what is, you know... But in the second half of the book, you kind of see him as becoming like the the voice, Thomas Mann's voice, and trying and trying to warn Hans Castorp uh, against the radical ideas of NAFTA, which gets a bit more unhinged um, later uh, as the book goes on. Um, and I'm starting to look at the way these characters stand in for these different. Uh, I guess ideologies, and I'm just thinking mostly of NAFTA, Shosha, sorry, NAFTA, Cenabrini, and Castor. I think Castor might represent not Europe, but at least like the German society or like the average everyday German who is kind of susceptible to both these basic liberal democratic enlightenment ideals, also uh, ex radicalism, fascism, extreme militism. And I think, you know, what we know now. <laughs> About World War One and what happens later, we can see that as as like we know that you know, you know, like there is this battle of ideas that was going on, but it's also like um, we know which side eventually won out, um, even after the First World War, and this was something that was probably bothering Thomas Mann um, at his time. Um, and I finally want to talk more about other themes of the book, but I don't want to make this a long video. So the last thing I'll say about it is that I really like one of the central themes of the book, which is time. 
Um, I think it is one of the best books that has talked about uh, time as like a, a philosoph you know, philosophically and also makes me kind of appreciate you know what it means to be alive what it means to be like a human being that gets to live in a certain amount of time magic mountain is not just a physical place that happens to be where uh, all these you know sick and chronically ill people live it is a place that is kind of detached from the worldly affairs of continental europe um Castor is taken away from his ordinary life as a student and has to develop in this new environment where he gets to meditate on all these questions of like justice, beauty, art, truth, life, death, love, and um, pretty much anything that is worth thinking about. And it makes me wonder whether he would have become, because you get to notice Hans becoming more intellectually, morally, and spiritually mature as the novel progresses. It makes me wonder if he nor carried, carried on living his normal life in the flatlands, so to speak. Would he have developed in any way? Are people actually stunted into becoming morally, intellectually mature by just being interested in practical affairs? I don't know. I, I, I don't really know. But there's something, there's like this timeless quality in being in the magic mountain of being um, removed and attached from the concerns and worries of everyday life. And it's very enchanting. And it kind of made my experience with lockdown <laughs> the past few months uh, a lot more magical. Uh, and I want to recommend this book, but I, 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 I know that for most casual readers, it is very boring. It is probably not worth your time. Uh, and it's very frustrating. Um, but for those who, uh, I guess our die high dar high literature fans who are interested in reading things outside of their comfort zone, interested in maybe spending a few months of their lives uh, reading a book that they might not, not even like at the end, I would recommend it. Um, I don't think there is any book that you shouldn't like. You shouldn't not give a chance unless you do know that, like from reviews, that it's mediocre at best. Um, I hope you guys like this review. I know it's been a while, but I've been really busy, and I'll see you next time. Take care.